this is Gary Galanti, and I'm here to present a brief screencast about what is neonatal cholestasis. The objectives of this screencast are to first be able to have the viewer list definitions of what neonatal cholestasis is, second to discuss the major pathophysiologic mechanisms which underlie cholestasis, and then use that to describe why neonates are more susceptible to the development of cholestasis, and finally conclude with some important considerations that a clinician has to have um, when dealing with cholestasis. Neonatal cholestasis is defined as the reduction of bile formation and or flow by the liver. That's the physiologic definition. Pathologically how that will present is a buildup of bile pigmentation and bile pigment in the hepatocytes and bile ducts as well as some of the other constituents of bile. However, we cannot biopsy all patients with cholestasis for obvious reasons, so we often resort to a clinical and biochemical de definition, which relates to the fact that these constituents of bile, such as bilirubin, bile acid, and cholesterol, things that are normally excreted in the bile, become uh, accumulated in the blood and or extrahepatic tissues outside of the liver. Within the blood, the most common definition uh, in neonates is a conjugated bilirubin that is greater than 17 micromoles per liter and greater than 20% of the total bilirubin. Now when the constituents accumulate in extra hepatic tissues, for example such as the skin, the bilirubin may collect and cause a yellowish discoloration which is referred to as jaundice. Jaundice usually only, only presents however when the bilirubin is greater than 50 micromoles per liter, uh, thus is not always clinically uh, as useful and may not be detected until the bilirubin has significantly increased. In terms of the pathophysiology of cholestasis, as mentioned, it is a result of either reduced bile formation or flow, and that can uh, arise due to a few different reasons, but first we have to quickly talk about how bile flows. So bile is formed in the uh, due to the contributions of the hepatocytes and the cholangiocytes, the hepatocytes being the primary cells of the liver, and the cholangiocytes being the cells that line the bile ducts or the bile canaliculi, which you can see here. The important thing that we're going to talk about is that while the bilirubin accumulation is what creates the jaundice appearance, it does not explain the reason for uh, cholestasis, which is due to poor bile flow. The bile canaliculi are channels that transport bile to small biliary ducts that travel towards the hilum or the center of the liver. As they do, they drain into progressively larger ducts. These channels then collect bile that is formed by the combined secretions of the hepatocytes and the cholangiocytes. The constituents of bile uh, that are secreted by these cells include bilirubin, cholesterol, phospholipids, and organic anions like phosphate. However, Water is also secreted, and, and in fact, water secretion is what actually drives bile flow. Water movement is passive, however, and it actually follows the solute secretion. The two most important solutes that drive water flow here are bile acids, also known as bile salts, and chloride. Bile acids are the, mo the most important, and they are secreted through special transporters known as the bile salt exporter proteins. And, they, and this uh, excretion can be impaired due to three main reasons. The first is that something is intrinsically wrong with the bile salt transporter due to an underlying genetic mutation. Secondly, you can have medications or inflammatory mediators or other uh, molecules, uh, exo exogenous or endogenous, that affect the regulation or function of the transporters. And three, if the liver cell itself is injured by systemic disease, the liver cells will lack the energy needed to power these transporters. So the issue can be at an export level, at the cellular level, or it can also occur uh, at the ducts. As I mentioned, the transporters uh, promote bile flow, and the, the bile ultimately will enter uh, the ducts after uh, collecting all of the constituents and these ducts start within the liver uh, and the become progressively larger and eventually form uh, a large duct that drains the entire liver known as the common hepatic duct and then also down 
uh, into uh, uh, joining up with the duct from the gallbladder and uh, into the common bile duct, which drains ultimately into the small bowel. So obstruction can occur at any point along this um, pathway and lead to cholestasis, uh, either within the ducts within the liver or external to the liver. Finally, cholestasis can result from reduction in bile acid recirculation and uptake. Now I've talked a lot about how bile acids need to be excreted by the hepatocyte or the um, uh, cholangiocyte. However, to export it you also have to be able to produce it, which is the main job of the liver cell, uh, and a large portion of bile salts are actually recirculated in what's known as the enterohepatic circulation. So you have bile salts um, and other bile constituents that drain from the liver uh, and the gallbladder into the small bowel, and then they are progressively reabsorbed throughout the length of the small bowel and even to some extent within the colon. And then they uh, are then taken up by the portal blood, uh, portal circulation, and they make their way back to the liver, where if you can imagine this being the blood side, the bile salts then need to be taken up by the, um, uh, the liver cells. So anything that affects recirculation, particularly the reabsorption of bile acids in the small bowel, can also actually affect bile flow. So it's like it can either be an importer problem or an exporter problem. So why are neonates particularly susceptible to the development of cholestasis? Well, for, for one, they tend to have an immature hepatocellular bile acid excretion um, so that the transporters aren't as active the cellular mechanisms for um, uh, producing uh, bile flow in general are reduced. Not only that, as I'd mentioned, the bile acid recirculation de it depends on uptake in the small bowel, and that is also reduced in the newborn. This function in both of these aspects will improve significantly over the next few months to year. However, as a result, this is the most likely way that liver disease will present in a neonate, uh, whereas if you compare this to an adult or an older child, the most likely way that liver injury presents is actually with hepatitis or an elevation in liver enzymes without necessarily having jaundice. In addition, I said that the liver cell is sensitive and needs to be able to have energy to power the transporters, and there are a lot of things that newborns are uh, at particular risk for, for one, infection, and two, this is the classic time where a congenital, as the name implies, a neonatal onset disease will present. Um, and so there's a variety of different diseases that can ultimately present with cholestasis. Um, and this large number of potential causes, some of which are benign and others which are actually uh, more severe and like potentially life-threatening need to be recognized and differentiated. And that's the main challenge that actually the physician will uh, encounter. So these are the main considerations that uh, I, I have in mind when I th think of a patient with neonatal cholestasis. So the first is, can I identify an underlying disease or illness um, that has associated problems that are actually outside of the liver that can be, as mentioned, life-threatening or are important to identify and prevent or treat. So an example of this is infection. So if a newborn has underlying sepsis or a urinary tract infection that goes untreated, the consequences are not necessarily going to be uh, to the liver, but uh, can be life-threatening if, if not uh, diagnosed that the liver can actually be a clue um, or canary in the, in the mind if you, if you use that analogy to something else that's actually going on. And also, the uh, common, uh, sorry, the not extremely common but certainly not uncommon diseases such as endocrinopathies um, like hypopituitarism can present with life-threatening hypoglycemia if missed and actually commonly present with neonatal cholestasis, cholestasis as the first presenting feature. So that's the first element. The second element is having an underlying disease which if diagnosed early can be treated to prevent progression of liver disease. So an example of this is a condition known as biliary atresia, which is an obstructive uh, disease that affects the larger bile ducts. 
of the liver and eventually progresses to liver failure and cirrhosis. And there is good evidence that if it is caught and recognized early uh, and managed surgically uh, with a, a means of draining uh, the liver uh, to bypass this obstruction, uh, your outcomes are far better and the need for eventual liver transplantation is significantly reduced. Third is knowing that if you have cholestasis, you are now at risk for complications from cholestasis. So the earliest and uh, probably more significant uh, issues in the short term are the consequences of um, the fact that bile is needed for fat absorption and also for fat soluble vitamin absorption. So if you lose that ability to uh, absorb fat uh, or it's significantly impaired, then you will have malnutrition, which is uh, often a, a big issue in, in neonates at, at a time of the life where they're very susceptible to, mal to malnutrition. Also, if you lose fat soluble vitamins, those include A, D, E, and K, or not absorbing them well enough, then you can actually get significant deficiencies of those vitamins leading to consequences and actually the most important one short in the short term is vitamin K because it's an important factor needed for clotting factors and so if you lose too much vitamin K you can actually have life-threatening bleeds uh, and in newborns particularly intracranial bleeds can be life-threatening and, and go uh, undiagnosed uh, so that's an important consideration and then bile acids while they have a very important role um, and regulating and protecting the liver to some extent when they accumulate as in what happens with cholestasis within the liver cells they actually cause damage to the hepatocytes there they act as a detergent to, to help solubilize fat but when they accumulate in the liver they actually can damage the cell membranes and they can actually damage cell function so over time uh, this can actually da severely injure the liver and lead to progressive uh, fibrosis or scarring of the liver and ultimately potentially cirrhosis. And then finally, uh, knowing what the cause is uh, in a lot of cases can, can either be very reassuring or alternatively can be quite worrisome uh, in terms of long-term outlook and need for liver transplantation or progression of liver disease. And so um, most of the time we actually cannot find a cause of cholestasis. However, if we do find a cause, um, related to say a viral infection, uh, is, uh, importantly a condition like uh, cytomegalovirus, the outcome for the liver is often actually quite good uh, and in a lot of cases that's uh, reassuring to family and uh, on the other hand something like biliary atresia like, like mentioned is actually a fairly poor prognosis for the liver in the long term. So again important even if we can't do anything necessarily to modify the, the course uh, but to be able to give the family that information. So that is uh, all. Thank you very much.